Good morning. And I'd like to open this portion of our service with a reading of the 103rd Psalm. Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Verse 13, as a father has compassion, on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and it, its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Happy Father's Day. I want to thank the ladies from my church who came out this morning to support me. I got a whole row of friends right here in front. They don't know that they're going to have to go hear this same sermon again <laughs> at my church. But it's great to be here. I love Abundant Life Church. I've been in bigger churches, and I've been in older churches, and I've been in newer churches, but I believe this is the most beautiful church that I know. I love the light in here and the windows, and I love the greetings and the welcome. I'm blessed to be here with you today. And I have to tell you, I'm a little red-faced and embarrassed about what happened the last time I was here. I was here in March, and when I walked in the door, you gave me a coffee cup filled with Hershey's kisses, and it was a warm day in March, and I took that coffee cup straight back out to my truck, and I left it in there all day, and the next morning, I took it into work, and I thought it was a wonderful thing to have a cup, cool, cup full of kisses. I just thought that was the greatest idea. 
But when I took it into work the next day and opened it up, one of those kisses, and when I opened, the chocolate had become white. Now, I ate it anyway. It was still good. But <laughs> one of my coworkers ate one and told me that chocolate was old. So I threw him away, and I debated whether or not to call Mark and tell him. But I figured I didn't want the church to be giving away old chocolate to newcomers. And so I did call Mark and I told him, Mark, those kisses you gave me were old. And uh, Mark called me right back and said, Doug, those, the idea the kisses were new, the cups were new, the ch we tested the chocolate, the chocolate's good. And so I felt kind of bad about that whole thing. But I'm um, just rejoicing that you gave me another opportunity to come back and preach. And uh, I know some of you uh, struggled a little bit when you saw me this morning. The last time I was here, I had hair. 25 years of dreadlocks and the chemotherapy has cost me my hair. People that I've known all my life don't recognize me anymore without my hair. And, and, and sometimes I get a little tired of the chemical uh, roller coaster, and I think of giving up. But I'm reminded of a friend of mine named Reverend Jim Brown. I went to hear him preach in Cannonsburg at a little storefront church on his 91st birthday. He and my mother were neighbors in Muse, and he told the story of getting his inspection license. He was a mechanic. He said in 1959, he got his inspection license. He said that was a big deal for a black man in 1959. He had 11 children, and he was thinking about how it would help him to feed and raise his family. And he said right after he got the inspection license, he heard the voice of God speak to him and tell him, this is the last car you're ever going to work on. And he said he immediately began to argue and wrestle with God and said, God, I have 11 kids. I just got this license. I can make a lot of money. I don't want to stop inspecting cars and working on cars. And he said the next car that he worked on, the gas tank exploded. He spent three weeks in Mercy Hospital with burns in 1959. He said he never worked on another car. But he said whenever people ask him, Reverend, when are you going to quit preaching? He always tells them, whenever God tells me to and not a moment before. I like that story. And I'm a storyteller, and I brought this story for you today. The name of the story is A Wasted Day. In the faint light of the attic, an old man, tall and stooped, bent his great frame and made his way to a stack of boxes that sat near one of the little half windows. Brushing aside a wisp of cobwebs, he tilted the, cup, the top box toward the light and began to carefully lift out one old photograph album after another. Eyes once bright but now dim searched longingly for the source that had drawn him there. It began with the fond recollection of the love of his life long gone, and somewhere in these albums was a photo of her he hoped to rediscover. Silent as a mouse, he patiently opened the long buried treasures and soon was lost in a sea of memories. Although the world had not stopped spinning when his wife left it, the past was more alive in his heart than his present aloneness. Setting aside one of the dusty albums, he pulled from the box what appeared to be a journal from his grown son's childhood. He could not recall ever having seen it before or that his son had ever kept a journal. 
Why did Elizabeth always save the children's old junk? He wondered, shaking his head. Opening the yellowed pages, he glanced over a short reading and his lips curved in an unconscious smile. Even his eyes brightened as he read the words that spoke clear and sweet to his soul. It was the voice of the little boy who had grown up far too fast in this very house and whose voice had grown fainter and fainter over the years. In the utter silence of the attic, the words of a dowless six-year-old worked their magic and carried the old man back to a time almost totally forgotten. Entry after entry stirred a sentimental hunger in his heart, like the longing a gardener feels in the winter for the fragrance of spring flowers. But it was accompanied by the painful memory that his son's simple recollections of those days were far different from his own. But how different? Reminded that he had kept a daily journal of his business activities over the years, he closed his son's journal and turned to leave, having forgotten the cherished photo that originally triggered his search. Hunched over to keep from bumping his head on the rafters, the old man stepped to the wooden stairway and made his descent, then headed down a carpeted stairway that led to the den. Opening a glass cabinet door, he reached in and pulled out an old business journal. Turning, he sat down at his desk and placed the two journals beside each other. His was leather-bound and engraved neatly with his name in gold, while his son's was tattered and the name Jimmy had been nearly scuffed from its surface. He ran a long, skinny finger over the letters as though he could restore what had been worn away with time and use. As he opened his journal, the old man's eyes fell upon an inscription that stood out because it was so brief in comparison to other days. In his own neat handwriting were these words. Wasted the whole day fishing with Jimmy. Didn't catch a thing. With a deep sigh and a shaking hand, he took Jimmy's journal and found the boy's entry for the same day, June 4. Large, scrawling letters pressed deeply into the paper, read, went fishing with my dad. Best day of my life. I love that story. It's so easy to get caught up in the world and the work and everything that's going on and we neglect the needful thing and we fail to invest in our families and they suffer. I was so blessed this morning to see half the people here get up and come up on the altar getting ready for vacation Bible school. What a blessing to see the participation and the work that this church is doing. The story is told of a man in Philadelphia who had a major argument with his son, and the son stormed out of the house and did not return. A few days went by, and the father decided to take out an ad in the Philadelphia newspaper that said, James, I'm sorry we argued. Please meet me tomorrow at noon at the diner on the corner of 5th Street and Center Avenue. The next day, 37 Jameses showed up for lunch. It reminds me of the portrait Jesus paints of the father of the prodigal son in Luke 15. God the Father waits for us with open arms no matter what we've done so that he can love us and feed us and fellowship with us. 
A.W. Tozer said, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And I have come to believe that the men and women I work with at the mission often suffer from distorted images of God. I have come to believe that for many people, their early conceptions of God are tied up in their understandings of their earthly fathers. It's sad to me how many people I meet who come from broken homes, who are children of drug addicts or alcoholics, who have never known a father. They have never known a father who protects. They have never known a father who provides. They have never known a father who cares. They have never known a father who takes time. They have never known a father who listens. They have never known a father who loves. My own father was a mechanic. He was a carpenter. He was a plumber. He was an electrician. He always worked two jobs or three. He was a great provider. And my father was relatively well known in the small town of Houston where I grew up. I'll never forget being a paper boy at the age of eight or nine and getting into a fight with another paper boy. And that guy went and told his dad and his dad came and confronted me and when his dad confronted me, I told his dad, stay right here, I'm gonna go home and get my dad. And that guy chased me all the way home and begged me not to tell my father. My father was a good protector. I thank God for you today, if you are a good, good father to your children. I thank God today if your father was a good, good father to you. I think of poor Joseph, who had to raise a son who wasn't his. I love the story of Jesus being lost in Jerusalem at the age of 12. Mary and Joseph go to look for him, and they find him in the temple debating with the scribes and the Pharisees and the scholars. And they say, son, how could you do this to us? And Jesus says, don't you know that I had to be about my father's business? Even at 12 years old, Jesus was talking about his heavenly father. I think if I was Joseph, I would have been a little upset. <laughs> I don't know. And I think about Nicodemus sneaking in to see Jesus at night in John chapter 3. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. I, think, I thank God that I stand in a room full of born-again believers. We have a good, good father. Nicodemus had to be born again. He had to be born once of water and then again of spirit. All who believe in Jesus get a new father, a heavenly father. And I came today to talk about John 14. It's a familiar passage. In my father's house, there are many rooms, many mansions. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I'm going to read from John chapter 14. I'm going to read the first 13 verses. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. The King James says, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, 
I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Don't let your heart be troubled. I meet so many people, even good Christians, who ignore this teaching. Do not let your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many mansions, many rooms. Now that word mansions is not what we think of as a big fancy house. No, it it simply means a dwelling place. I love the picture of a room added on to daddy's house. I can picture a Middle Eastern village where the children were all raised under one roof, but once the son got married, the father would build an addition onto the house. I can see my father's house growing and growing and growing. I can see hundreds and thousands of rooms, one big happy family. And I don't think Jesus was talking about someday. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be there also. I don't think he was talking about some distant heaven that we enter when we die. I think he was talking about right here, right now, in his presence, walking closely beside him, abiding with him, dwelling with him, living with him, coming to him. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am humble and gentle in spirit, and you will find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, for everyone who seeks to save their life will lose it, but everyone that gives up their life for my sake will find it. Jesus said, the Father and I are one. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
Jesus said, you too can come to the Father. As I close, my prayer for you today is that you will draw closer to the Father. The Bible reminds us that if we draw close to God, he will draw close to us. If you have a good, good earthly father, celebrate him today. If you are a father, love your children today. If you don't have a good relationship with your father, may today be a day of reconciliation and forgiveness. May God the Father cause his face to shine upon you and love you and be gracious to you. Amen. Happy Father's Day.